welcome to Queen Anne's County School Board meeting for September 1st, 2021. Uh, do I have a motion to? Yeah, Mr. President, uh, I move uh, pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, that the Board of Education in Queen Anne's County uh, meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction and any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. We'll be back at six o'clock. Thank you. Welcome to Queen's County Board of Education meeting, September 2021. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, you might notice uh, that we are distancing up here. Two of our members have decided not to wear a mask at their choosing, uh, so we've social distancing, but they do do what the policy requires when we go through schools and our boards to wear masks as they're in our buildings. Uh, so anybody has any comments can, but uh, I just want that clarified so everybody sees this, could know what's going on. Thank you. Okay, board members, you've had Okay, do we need approval or agenda, Tammy? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Second. I have a motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, you have a minutes of August the 4th open session. Has everybody time to look at those? If I may, sir, may I make a motion to approve the open and closed session minutes of April 4th, 2021? Mm -hmm. Excuse me, August 4th, 2021. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Okay. I have uh, approval of minutes for August the 4th closed session. Mr. Smith, correction. Open and closed were both voted on. May I make a motion to accept the minutes for the work session on August 18th, 2021? Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. <clears throat> She did, she did two of them together. Huh? She did 3.02 and 3.03 together. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Thank you, sir. Now, now, now I have, uh, did, did you, what about the 18th, have we done? Sir. Yes, okay. that was the last one. Okay. I had a different on my schedule, I'm yeah. sorry. I apologize, sir. No problem, no, it's different. The only mistake I make tonight, we got it made. Yeah, <laughs> God bless. Okay, moving on, Shining Star, Dr. Salins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we going or are we just standing here? If, if you would wear your mask, you're up. able to okay. be up here. Okay, so for the test test. Okay. The fun part of our evening this evening. Several staff members here tonight. We have Kevin Kintop here. I'd ask him to come up because he's made the nominations from the Arise Academy program administrator who oversaw summer school this year. And I'd also like to invite up Becky Frazier. So this award is being presented to Becky Frazier, a paraprofessional from Centerville Elementary School, who went above and beyond to help our Queen Anne's County Public Schools through our summer school program. Becky is receiving this award as a representative of all of the support staff that worked this summer to make sure that our programs ran smoothly. We are grateful for the folks in transportation who helped organize buses and safely get our students from home to school, for the members of Sodoxo who made sure that our students had breakfast and lunch, for our custodians who moved furniture between buildings and cleaned so that our classrooms looked wonderful and were safe for our smallest little learners, our littles as I call them. For our school secretaries and board employees who helped ensure that payroll was accurate and employees got paid, and finally, for our instructional assistants who worked closely with our children in the classroom to help them learn through the summer. As with everything we do in schools, our summer program would have never gotten off the ground without all of these shining stars. So thank you for being an awesome representative for all of the shining stars. And I don't know how many staff 
we do have, but we're going to try to get one for everybody so that we can pass them out. Okay. So thank you so much. Let's Thanks get a picture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it was a, a, an incredibly successful program this summer, and we yeah, hope to duplicate that next year. It was very nice. I really enjoyed it. And now we have the Energizer Bunny Award, which was also um, nominated by Kevin Kintop, our Rise Academy Program Administrator. And this award is being presented to Joy Gardner. Joy is a teacher at Ken Island Elementary School who works several weeks over the summer instructing first graders at Ken Island High School summer school program. Joy is receiving this award as a representative for all of the teachers, supervisors, and administrators who helped to make the 2021 summer school program possible. In order to offer programs at five different sites this week, this year, this summer, for eight weeks after 15 months of COVID was quite a heavy lift, we know that. We had teachers from every level agreeing to work as substitutes when needed in classrooms from one, two, and up to eight weeks as site coordinators. We had teachers who were retired, teachers who were just graduated and were getting ready to start a new school year, and everything in between. Administrators from almost every school spent time at our site providing support to the teachers and the site coordinators. Curriculum supervisors helped plan, order, and deliver instructional materials so that teachers would be able to implement that through the program. The bottom line is that everyone deserves this Energizer Buddy Award for the dedication to helping our students bridge that gap. So thank you so much for being a representative and for all your hard work. And I did want to recognize that, I'm sorry, I apologize. From Bayview Financial, this is sponsored by Bayview Financial. Mr. Chip Brittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys were not able to be here tonight and they're always here, so we're missing them. So um, just a round of applause for them too because they are very big very, very big supporters. And this is the cool site ever, right? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much. Michelle, I can't, yep. There you go. Thank you very much. Little wide angle. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. Oh, Joy. I'm sorry. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. Next on our agenda is uh, board involvement. Hey, Ellie, you want to start her off? Sure. So um, on the 9th of August, I was um, really excited to have lunch with the ANS group, and it was lovely. Uh, the whole setup was extremely well done. I very much appreciated the hard work that went into it. And I was, and I said it on the SRO this, the, um, that Gary Hoffman did. And so that was a great presentation. We had it here at the board meeting a few months ago and you can't have it, um, you cannot hear about safety enough. So it was nice to hear it again. And then on the 16th of August, I was again, really thrilled to meet some new people at the new teacher orientation at the Queen Anne's County High School and speak to some people that I had already met. And so that was lovely. So thank you for lunch on both occasions. It was great. And then um, I was here for the kickoff event um, because of the weather, we had it virtually. So it was so smooth and so quick. You came up, did your piece and it was wonderful. So that was nice. Um, and then just tonight, of course, was going to be the kickoff for the Queen Anne's County Goes Purple at the courthouse. It's been postponed for a week in case you hadn't heard that. Um, so next Wednesday, I encourage everyone to go to the old historic courthouse. I believe it's at 730 for the kickoff for the QAC Goes Purple for um, Substance Abuse Awareness. And that would be it. Nothing. Uh, just two mornings, uh, yesterday morning, went to Queen Anne's County High School for their opening day. Um, the kids were thrilled to be back. The seniors were thrilled to be back. Uh, and then Monday morning, I was Sublersville Middle School. Um, the fifth graders, yeah, they were excited. <laughs> they were very excited. So that's all I can yeah, okay, so I'm starting to realize that the best part of this job is actually doing school visits. <laughs> so I got out to uh, 
Mattapique Elementary School. I met uh, the new principal, Ms. Minton. And uh, she was out front, of course. I stayed out front a little bit and welcomed the new kids in. Uh, it was a very pleasant affair and uh, nice to see all the kids eager to get back into the school. I asked Ms. Mitten uh, a little bit about her education or education uh, work experience and after three or four minutes she finally finished. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really confident and um, of course welcomed her to uh, Mattapique as the principal. Then I stepped over to Mattapique Middle and had a great, uh, enjoyable uh, tour with Dr. McCoy. We had a lot, a lot of the classes. Of course, the middle schools were already, were already in the classrooms. I met uh, one of the new world language teachers, Spanish teacher, and uh, welcomed him. So that was good. I'm a big proponent of world languages. Recommend everybody take one, at least in high school. And uh, then I stepped over to Graysonville Elementary School. So Tom Walls has taken over as principal from his camp. Um, big shoes to fill, but uh, he came from um, Southersville Elementary. He did a bang up job over there, from what I recall. And uh, I welcomed him to uh, to Graysonville. And uh, Tom and I actually have uh, a little bit of history together. We didn't know it, but when we were about 18, 19 years old, we were neighbors at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. We were both paratroopers in the 82nd Airborne. So we uh, have a little common ground there. So it's always enjoyable to talk to him. But um, uh, other than that, uh, the kids were very happy everywhere I saw, teachers as well. And um, I want to thank Dr. Salins for jumping on board as quick as she did early and uh, getting all that accomplished. So good job. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to attend all our schools. I started off <clears> up in <throat> Suddersville, Churchill, Centerville area, Graysonville, and then Ken Island. Um, three different days, and I didn't know them all in one day. But the thing that amazed me, three of us board members were up here a year and a half ago. We turned on a dime. We went from in-person in learning to virtual, and it was tough. We finally, last spring, got back the hybrid program. These kids' faces and the teachers that I saw at every school simply amazed me. I mean, for the days we sit up here as board members and have days we would probably think second guess ourselves, those are the, the days like yesterday show what these kids really want to be. They wanted to be back there. The teachers wanted to be back there. It's a great, it's a great feeling, and uh, I don't think there's anything better than in-person learning and the way this has been handled. And I must just say, I mean, the day I'm at Centerville, and I think Dr. Salins was there too, um, or well she was, because she's she was with me one kid. And you know, they have I think 32 buses come in there. It was amazing. I mean, you're talking pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, and second. It's clockwork. I mean, it's amazing how they can run this operation and do this. And Mrs. Fresnel, I'll give her all the credit in the world. I think she's up to 570 and counting. Yeah. Um, Our enrollment's definitely up. Mm -hmm. It's up. And, uh, you know, uh, Sean Kenna, when I was down at the uh, Ken Island High School, and he knows people, they're friendly, they're, 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 it's just, it's amazing how kids can adapt. And uh, I'm just so happy we're back and heading in the right direction. Thank you. Okay. Patty, you? Yeah, Amy, do you mind? Yep. So I, as well, was able to get out to all the schools. The executive team split up and divided and um, flip-flopped, went to half the schools on one day and half the other, and we flip-flopped. So I had an opportunity, Mr. Pinder and I, to get out and go to the building. And we captured some pictures with a little bit of help from Mrs. Power Waters. And um, they're just, that they just speak for themselves. I don't really need to say too much. Um, I, I did what all of you have said as uh, to see our staff members um, excited, um, students excited. Even we saw little teary-eyed parents this morning sending their little to school. Um, I, this also shows uh, we've got two tents at the high schools now for our high school students to be able to go outside and socially distance during lunchtime. Um, so just, just the little things that everybody's been able to put together to make it successful. And um, it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing. It's, it's a great thing. It's wonderful, really, honestly. I, I just am lost for words because it's so powerful, very powerful. So this is our opening day. The next one. Okay. So I'll get to this in, a, in yep. just a second. Sure. Um, 
everything that everyone shared is what I experienced. August was extremely busy for us. Yeah. Um, I mean, we started off with the retreat. We did new teachers, which a lot of you were a part of. So you saw what was going on and, and then um, to welcome the students back. Um, and as Dr. Salen um, said, we divided and conquered. Um, they went to seven schools on day one. We went to seven. And when I say we, Dr. Kibler and Ms. Towers joined me and then Dr. Salens and Sid did the other seven and then we flip-flopped. So we were able to be present and greet all of the kids and be there. So it, it was so nice to see all of the kids back in, in the building. Um, and the schools looked amazing. Mm -hmm. Miss um, Towers, we may lose her to become a teacher. <laughs> she yeah. kept saying, oh, I want to be a teacher. No, we're not. <laughs> so I'm like, no, Jane. No, we're not. No, Jane. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, so it was great. It was, a, it was an awesome start, and it is all due to Dr. Salen's leadership. So she um, did a phenomenal job coming in, hitting the ground running, and getting us off. off. So um, so the spotlight for the month of August. Hey, you're on of applause for all of our people. So um, we're starting off with Bayside, um, and, and as um, we had talked about, I mean, we were hiring people right up to the end. This was a fifth grade team member that um, joined the team, and then you can see the schools being clean, the halls are nice and shiny, um, so ready for the students to return. Um, and then you have Centerville Elementary School. This captures one of the team building activities that the teachers did on their week back. Um, and what they had to do is to flip that tablecloth only using their feet. So um, I didn't, I guess they're working on it over here on, on the far left, but I'm sure that was an interesting activity. But teamwork, teamwork. Um, Churchill Elementary School, they had a um, new club open house and what they did was any of the new um, the new students coming in, they had um, a meeting, they did a tour of the building, uh, books were read to them and then they also received a snack and then a, um, a stuffed cub. So it, a, a baby lion, I guess, is their, it's their mascot, so a stuffed lion. Grayson Elementary, um, this picture is showing their individual student created math toolkits. Um, um, that were provided for each of the students so that they can engage and use their own materials and, and not have to share. Um, Kennard Elementary School celebrating the end of summer school. So that was at the high school. So they're, they're very excited they, they made it through the entire summer. So Ken Island Elementary, um, this picture's capturing just a partnership with the uh, United Methodist Church. They provided them with some snacks, some well wishes for um, the start of a great year. So that's Ms. Cornish, the new principal, and some of her front office staff. Mattapique Elementary School, they had um, a welcome back luncheon, which was sponsored by the PTA. Southersville Elementary School, that's uh, Principal Kayleen Kovac. She provided a uh, flower for each of her staff members uh, for all of their hard work uh, during the week back. Centerville Middle School, this was an orientation that happened earlier in the month of August and um, the National Junior Honor Society was there to welcome the new sixth graders. Mattapique Middle School, you have Dr. McCoy and Dr. Salins um, just ready for the school. So this would have been on one of the visits during the beginning of the week. Stevensville Middle School, they also hosted a sixth grade orientation earlier um, in the month of August. Um, I found all of the things that they had, the, the I guess rotations the kids went through supporting the transition to um, middle school, their counselor did that. Um, Dr. Schrettengoss did a day in the life of a sixth grader, math specialist exploring the agile mind math curriculum. And then their teacher specialist, Jacqueline Toomey, did navigating power school for parents. So um, while the kids were doing their piece, then um, she did the piece for parents. So I thought that was very interesting. Well done. So um, Sudlersville Middle School, they're showcasing the uh, presentation of the teacher of the year car. Um, Stephanie McKenzie received with our partnership with Hartrich Ford and all of the staff were there to cheer her on. So that was a very nice um, reception ceremony. 
in Queen Anne's County High School, you have the ninth graders. Um, this is during the ninth grade orientation and you have three of the four administrators to the right. Um, they're ready to start the new year. Fall sports um, are off at Queen Anne's and the building is ready to go and it, and it does look great. And then Ken Island, last but not least, Ken Island High School. Um, they are having a veteran and first responder appreciation night. They're going to have a VIP tent for those folks. They get in free, um, $5 admission for all other uh, general admission. But so that's this Friday at 6 p.m. And I thought that was a very nice gesture. So, and that is for the month of August. The Boosters has been doing that night for, for years. Oh, have they? Yes. No, that's nice. Years. Yes. That's nice. Well, I see, I wouldn't know that. So thank you for and sharing that. That's a very nice gesture. I've been there and it's very nice. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to move on to the student oh, board. board uh, okay, now we move on to our student board members. Uh, Jackson Parks. Yep. Uh, so hi, I'm Jackson Park. I'm the new student board member from Ken Island High School. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say was just that we're obviously all back this week. The freshmen came back Monday and then the sophomores, juniors and seniors came Tuesday. Um, state testing is going to happen in the next few weeks, mainly for lower classmen who missed the mandatory state testing last year due to COVID. Uh, there's going to be a senior college info night sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, the football games are back, like we were just saying, and the students are very excited for that. And then we're playing Easton this Friday. Uh, the first interim report is going to come out at the end of the month, which will determine eligibility for sports in terms of GPA. Additionally, the theater department just announced that the spring production is going to be The Little Mermaid. Oh, nice. Um, also, I just wanted to say thank you for the large outdoor seating area with the tent because I personally know that I've taken advantage of that as well as all my friends. And I plan on continuing to do that. Uh, and then I just wanted to end with the fact that currently the homecoming activities are going to happen as planned and we will make adjustments as needed. That's all I have. Would you like to go with Brent? Um, hi, I'm Brett Fifo. I'm the uh, I'm the new QA, Queen Anne's County High School representative. Um, mainly, the Queen Anne's County High School is kind of reflected of like um, what Jackson said over here about. It's both very similar. We uh, the freshmen went back Monday, and then all the sophomores, juniors, and um, seniors came back Tuesday. Um, um, in the courtyard in the middle of the high school, we do have two tents set up with picnic um, tables surrounded all in the um, tent. So then all of the um, people that camp in the cafeteria can move over to the high school um, outside the courtyard. So that's a nice adjustment. I, and as same, as same as here, I've taken care of that, I've taken that advantage and I've sat outside with my friends. Um, the, uh, many of the sports um, teams have, are starting next week. I know personally, cross country starting September 9th in the one in the jungle. Um, that's over North Carolina. Um, I know that um, um, the football, volleyball, soccer are, are also starting next week. And that the college um, introduction to seniors is happening September 2nd, I, I believe, or September 3rd. Don't take my word on that, but um, so that pretty much is what's going on at the high school right now. Thank you. And it's kind of high school. Thank you. Thank you for your reports and best Welcome, luck gentlemen. in your year. Thank Welcome, you. gentlemen. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Our next will be citizen participation. Mark, would you like to? Sure. <coughs> Okay, <clears throat> we ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. The speakers should sign the roster including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have a specific question, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asked as but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. 
going to state your name and uh, what is it? Thank you. Just name and address for the record. And name and address. Um, you're all. Can you just all? You're all family, right? Yes. All, okay, so you you can just all get together then. It's you. Know. Okay. My name is Kimber Albright. I live at 334 Virginia Road in Stevensville, Maryland. The PCR test used to diagnose COVID is inaccurate, but yet masking, social distancing, school closings, and quarantining are all based on positivity rates of COVID. This ineffective test is cranking out false positives and this false data is being relied on to dictate the public school system. You are teaching our children that living in fear is the norm and that being scared is the right place to come from. That is flat out wrong. COVID poses no risk to our students. The CDC statistic for survival rate for untreated people who contract COVID ages zero to 70 is 99.95%. That is a statistical 100% survival rate. There is nothing to fear here, nothing at all. When humans, when humans, when humans are forced to wear a mask, it deprives them of oxygen, suppresses their constitutional right of free speech, robs them of their identity, not to mention they cannot identify those around them and the fact that masks do not stop COVID transmission. It's a viral thing. I have personally seen the devastation caused from my children wearing a mask all day. This is real. This is a direct attack on our children. My daughter has a medical exemption and the solutions offered to accommodate her can only be described as discrimination. Things like a separate room for her to go to before the exchange of each class where she will wait by herself and hear her peers switch classes. She would have and not be allowed to leave her six foot section in class. Others will not be allowed to enter the designated six foot area sitting by herself at lunch. This proposed discrimination plan proved so horrific that we have momentarily decided to sacrifice her medical and psychological needs so she can have the chance to socialize with her peers and play sports. These acts you commit are in ignorance. So step into the light of the truth. Consider more than just the false positive rate. Wake up. You each have personal power here. Use it. Failure for you to wake up to your own personal power and choose to rectify this situation will not only tarnish your soul, but swiftly make you personally accountable for the crimes against our children and the crimes against our constitutional rights as citizens of the United States of America. Reverse it now. Make a motion, second that motion, and vote to no mandatory masking. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. They have another family member. They, both up. of them saw, okay. Yes. Can you just state your name, honey? Thank you. Hello. Take your, to take your time. Hello. Oh, God, it's not working. Hello, my name is Kimber Albright with a Y. This is what I did not like about wearing a mask last year. Not seeing people's faces when I am in school, sometimes I can't recognize someone I go to school with every day. The mask covers up too much. Having to do gym with a mask on, it was hard to breathe and I wasn't able to, full, to go full out. Having to wear it one outside, we all need fresh air. Not being able to see someone's smile makes masks makes masks make people less friendly with each other following a rule that is based on untrue information this made me feel like i was being controlled for no good reason when kids said they wanted to wear masks even after they were vaccinated i won it made me wonder what was going on inside of them i knew they should do some research leaving the school building and thinking finally i could take my mask off then just kidding you can't because you have to ride the bus I would come home every day with a headache and I was sick much more often than I ever had been 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. Yeah, you, well, you can st sit in front of the mic or stand however you feel comfortable. Comfortable. Um, you're all one family, and my understanding is. Yes. Uh, is there more than one speaker? There is. Yes. Yes. Okay. So everybody will have. Three everybody minutes wants there. their two cents. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Can you state your name and the address for the record? Jim Davidson, 211 Long Creek Court, Stevensville, Maryland. Uh, I just want to speak. I won't take up much of your time, but because basically we were at the board meeting a month ago or whatever it was, a few weeks ago, and where Mr. Schifanelli and Ms. Bennett put out a slew of facts, figures, r rational thinking, and logic as to why the masks wouldn't be necessary. Okay. Then to me, the other side just said, well, we'd rather, we're going to do it. My son will do it because we're willing to do whatever we need to do. No facts, no figures, no logic, no ration to it. I just think, you know, the crux of this is it's a serious virus that's going around. I've been around quite a while. My mother was an RN, very successful with that. And what we did when we were kids, you got the flu and sick, you went home from school, stayed a few days till your fever broke, wait one more day, you can go back to school. Uh, I did the same thing with my four kids. I have 18 grandkids now in Queen Anne's County. And the mother of one of them is gonna be speaking also, so I don't wanna steal her thunder, but he has a speech and hearing problem from a baby, and to wear a mask in school is ridiculous for him. I mean, it's totally ridiculous. Not only ridiculous for him, but for the other students too with all the damage. Again, the facts, and I appreciate it, were presented, but it's just totally ignored. So to come in here now with all this, the statistics and the CDC, you know, information which isn't even you they're not even using the facts to me anyway is ridiculous so i would be curious to hear from the board members that voted no or voted yes to have the, the mandate as to what your your facts and figures show the uh, benefits of wearing the masks are this is a question. Yeah, at this at this time we don't take public. Uh, we don't interact okay. back and forth. All right, then take but, it as rhetorical. But, we, 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 but, but I, I, I hear you've asked you you that question. If, so. if you can convince us, believe me, if, if we felt and my family felt and all the people I, I have spoken to, if they felt there came a time for the masks to be necessary in school, they'd put the masks on and do what they had to do. But we don't see that. We don't see any proof of it. We see more damage than good. So as a parent and a grandparent, I tell my kids and their, their kids, be logical about this thing and fight it and do the best you can. If, if, and here's what's gonna happen anyway, folks. You're gonna mandate the mask if you do. These little kids, especially the, the elementary kids, if they even are subject to getting it or you can tell or whatever, these masks aren't gonna do anything for them anyway. They're gonna, you know, they, they have trouble going to the potty right now and you're taking, you know, you're expecting to wear masks. So I just think it's, it's a shame. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you guys, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'll put this right I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna go. How you doing? Hi, so my name is Christina uh, Davidson. I'm from Stevensville, Maryland, and um, I'm the mother of a young boy who uh, could not hear the first year of his life. So he has a speech delay, 
um, just for his privacy, I'm not going to say his name, but um, his pediatrician recommended that he goes into uh, the county program, Infants and Toddlers, in which he was given an IFSP, in, uh, Individualized Family Service Plan, and that involved um, the speech language pathologist to come out and work with him face to face. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. I mean, he had such wonderful interactions with them and grew lengths with them and his involvement with them. Um, and then we went, we hit COVID and everything went virtual. And it was, it was just like you'd imagine. I have four kids. So trying to keep three other kids around a computer while I'm trying to, to teach my four, at the time, three-year-old um, how to speak and articulate and pronounce words was very challenging. Challenging. Um, as time went on, he moved to what's called uh, an IFP, individualized, um, I'm sorry, IEP, individualized education plan, which involved him going to the Mattapeak uh, Elementary School, where he'd have also a, a speech language pathologist teach him. So we met her virtually. Times move forward. We eventually meet her in person, but we have to be masked. So this presents all kinds of challenges. You already have a child who has a, a insecurity, and he's he's the bravest, most resilient young man I know. But he has an insecurity already going in, and now we're going to cover his face, and now we're going to cover her face. So now the very beauty of a human being trying to manipulate their mouth and place their tongue within their face is being taken away, and this is a critical developmental period for my son. But now we're going to cover it, and we're going to make him feel uncomfortable, and we're going to have um, alternatives like a, 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 a clear face mask. But let me tell you, as a small child, when you approach him with a face shield, it's intimidating. And you need to be able to help him by manipulating your mouth and visually taking that in. So this has been outrageous that people aren't considering the detriment to these critical developmental years of the smaller children even, and also the, 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 what the county provides, the services that the county provides beyond your one through you know 12 grades, but to these little guys that are coming in, getting the benefit and beauty of what the county offers, but having this huge monster of a thing that's that's honestly just totally getting in the way of any beautiful progress they could make with the help of these, these wonderful speech language pathologists that have been hired in your county. I love them. They have been wonderful. And let me tell you, they don't agree that you should have a mask, that they should have a mask on, and that these students should have a mask on. Thank you. Thank you. My name is DJ Dosses. I live at 101 Somerset Road in Stevensville. And I'm going to speak really quickly because I've got a lot to say. But uh, throughout the last 18 months in the United States, COVID and all of its variants, including Delta, have resulted in over 4 million cases in children between the ages of 0 and 17. Of those cases, roughly 400 children have died. I want to repeat that statistic. Since the beginning of COVID, since this all started throughout the entire 18 months, throughout the entire United States, 400 children have died from COVID-19. And most of these deaths had significant comorbidities associated with them. This can be adjusted to an annual rate of 266 deaths. For the record, more children in the same age group die annually from the common flu. More children die every year from drownings. More children die every year from car accidents. And sadly, more children die every year from suicide. These straightforward and plain statistics should be all that we need to understand that COVID and all of its variants thus far, including Delta, are not a significant health risk to children. And because of this, there is no reason to mandate mask wearing in school. This is clear. The science is out. This is not debatable. So should we require students to wear a mask in order to protect older teachers, staff, parents, grandparents? This was the reason given last year when we returned to school. Under that assumption, under the assumption that masks are effective, this may have been valid reasoning back then. That was at least until the vaccine became widely available. The vaccine, vaccine is extremely effective. Governor Hogan's proclaimed this many times. It is extremely rare that a vaccinated person would ever get the virus, let alone die from it. In fact, 99.999% of vaccinated people have not had a deadly case of virus. Deadly case, according to CNN. Uh, it's quite simple. Children are safe from the virus. Adults had the vaccine available and therefore are safe from the virus. There's no need to base public policy on protected, protecting unvaccinated adults. I am quite certain the overwhelming majority of unvaccinated adults do not want your protection. 
We have to remember that parents and students have a choice. If parents want their students to wear a mask, have them wear one or even two, but this should not be forced on students. As I outlined, there's no legitimate reason for students to be forced to wear a mask eight hours a day in school. It's simply unfounded. Just because some parents or teachers are afraid or there's outside political pressure, we do not need to fall in line with everyone else when common sense tells us that a mask mandate should not be required. To bring it back to the statistics, every single student in Queen Anne's County could test positive for COVID, get the virus, and it is statistically unlikely that any of them would die or have any serious complications from it. Every student could get it, and it's statistically unlikely that anything negative would happen. So please stop talking about just trying to save one child or keep one child out of the hospital. It's a ridiculous thing to say. You're not implementing other policies that could save more lives or keep more children out of the hospital. You all are smarter than that. Have a better argument than one based on fear. The numbers do not lie. I implore you for the sake of bringing some peace and normality back to our children, vote again tonight and repeal your mask mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last man standing. Hi, good evening. I'm Jody Dossis, um, 101 Somerset Road, Stevensville, Maryland. Um, and thank you for letting us come and give public comment. Um, my dad mentioned that he's got 18 grandkids, and DJ and I have, we have 22 um, nieces and nephews with our kids included that live within three miles of each other on Ken Island. Our hope and our prayer when we all picked our properties is that we would send our kids through the public schools here in Queen Anne's County and for high school. And so that's been part of kind of what we've been equipping our kids to do. And the oldest grandkid is my daughter, Lily. And so she started last year, she came from a private school, but on, during ninth grade, she started at Ken Island High School. And she's a really great athlete, really great student, um, has her eyes set on going to Duke. And we think she can do it. We're encouraging her to do it. And we've been excited to put her into school here. Um, we, she was at Ken Island for the first semester and then we pulled her out because we had such a tough time with virtual learning. I know it was hard for everybody. We pulled her out and did some classical education, but she's back now at um, Ken Island High School. She had her first day yesterday. And so we really want to equip the county with these great student athletes. Like that's our, our hope and our prayer with all, all of us living here. Um, and so we're here representing um, those people. I also am here representing 1,200 people that have signed a petition asking um, that there not be a mask mandate in Queen Anne's County. Um, those petitions will be on their way to you. We'll mail them to you guys. We have their addresses and information if you want to contact those people. But a few of us um, were able to hit the ground running and we talked to people and that's what they are saying. And so I am here as a mom, but also my professional background is in television news. I worked in ABC for ABC. I wrote for the Bay Times for a few years when my kids are little. I have a lot of experience in looking at data and facts, a lot of experience in looking at things and trying to look at them, um, you know, really objectively and gathering information. And like my dad said, I feel like if the facts were there, I would put masks on my kids and that would be fine. The facts don't support it. And so we are asking on behalf of these 1,200 people that have signed this petition that you would be bold and courageous and do what Cecil County is doing in the state of Maryland and actually give parents the choice. I did a little research on the history of the Board of Education um, in our country. And what I saw is consistently throughout the few hundred years that we've had different boards of educations um, in our country that the common thread is that the Board of Education works for the people. And so we are the people. We are the public and we are telling you what the people are saying in Queen Anne's County. And they are saying, please take the masks off our kids. Our kids are asking us to come and say this. We are concerned about them. We are concerned that my daughter Lily doesn't want to go to school. This great student athlete who should be in the prime of enjoying school because of the masks, because she can't see her teachers, meet new friends, understand what someone is saying. We're worried that it's harming them and we are, would like to partner with you, like your website says, partner with you as parents to take the responsibility off of you and put it on us as parents and let us decide if our kid needs a mask or not. I have a kid who has an autoimmune issue. If she needs a mask, I'll put one on her, but give parents the choice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.
Don't worry about it. I've been vaccinated. Yes, we just have to do it. Do it to all our schools. We're going to do it here. Good evening. I have you just name and uh, address for the record. My name is Fred Koch, and I'm older than dirt. <laughs> I've been a Maryland resident for 56 years. 26 of those years have been right here on Kent Island. I currently live in Stevensville. Together, my wife and I have three children, two of whom are here on the island, with their spouses and our four grandchildren. Maryland schools and teachers have been good for our family and have prepared our offspring for collegiate level work and good jobs. However, COVID-19 has upended the education process, and I fear that many younger children will be negatively impacted by the lockdowns, virtual learning, and mask mandates, which leads me to the purpose of my attending this meeting tonight. I have serious concerns about the board proposal to mandate masks for children in our county schools, and worse, throughout the state of Maryland. I have sent each of you recent publications by the Heritage Foundation, which challenges the CDC's interpretation of its own data regarding the efficacy of requiring children to wear masks in school. Have you read these reports? I've seen what you sent. Okay. Yeah. We've all, have you we've read them? All, we've all been privy to what you said. Have you all read out. them? Have you seen them and gotten them? Yes, got them. They conclude that the CDC's data do not support their current policy of mandating masks. To be exact, the leading study on which the CDC bases their recommendation found that the COVID-19 infection rate in schools requiring students to wear masks was not statistically different or was not statistically significant compared with schools where mask use was optional. In light of this finding, the decision for children to wear masks should be up to their parents, not the county or state boards of education, or any legislation by the state of Maryland. I am asking that this board review, this, this review its decision to require masks in Queen Anne's County schools and make them optional at the discretion of their parents. Thank you for your time, but I, I, have, a, I, have, enough, I have a question for you. Why? You can, you can ask any questions, but we don't go back and forth at this public comment. But we will you ask any questions, we'll get the appropriate person to get well, back. Well, I, I want an answer to this question. We've got people standing out here in the hall. There's no air conditioning out there. Why, you know that there are people who want to, to present and who want to listen to what other people present. Why is it that you can't find a venue large enough for all of us to be, to, to be seated? or even just standing. Well, we're allowing everybody to have their say in public comment. This also is being taped and we broadcast so everybody across the county will be able to review every comment that you've made and every other participant. Well, I hope you're listening to the people. We, that we are, that we're not, we're here. And you have data to support what I've just said. I don't know how you made your decision before. I don't know what data you had, but chances are, if it was the CDC's data, you probably didn't interpret it the way it should have been interpreted anyway. Appreciate it. But thank, yeah, thank you. Thanks, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Good evening. Uh, your family members? Uh, yes. Yeah. State your name for the record. Name and okay. address. <clears throat> um, Becky Robes, um, don't start the time yet. Becky Robes, um, 2654 Cecil Drive, Chester, Maryland. Okay, we're good. Thank you for the chance to speak. Thank you to those of you who have responded to my emails, Ms. Bennett and Dr. Salins. Thank you to all of you for your time and effort for all the schools. I'll start by saying a lot of us just don't understand. You may have seen it written or heard it spoken somewhere. If we just replace the school desks with restaurant tables, the kids can all take their masks off when they sit down because that's exactly what they do when they're outside of school all the time with many different people from many different groups and families. It doesn't make sense. No one is expecting the school system to protect their child from germs or sickness. We never have. 
Every year prior to this new coronavirus, we dealt with strep, the flu, staph infection, mono, even pneumonia. Any one of these could have turned out to be life-threatening for our child. We have never expected the school to prevent our children from getting these infections because it's not the school's job to try to prevent germs. Yes, we should do all that is prudent and smart, cleaning surfaces, changing air filters, cover your mouth when you cough and sneeze, but to deprive our children of oxygen, which has been proven in numerous studies, I can send them to you, done by OSHA pre-COVID, so they're not biased. Um, to deprive our children of oxygen is not smart. It is swinging to the opposite extreme and is hurting our children in so many ways. I will repeat what you should already know from updated research that is undisputed. This is to try to prevent transmission of a virus that is not significant danger to children. Children are more likely to suffer side effects from a COVID vaccine or mask-induced infection than the virus itself. Yet that is so vastly acceptable to so many people called health experts. There is a 0.0049% chance of serious illness occurring from COVID in children. Please look at the data and prove me wrong. Why are we adding unnecessary, unproven measures of so-called safety to make adults feel better? The CDC guidelines are just that. They're guidelines. What they say, by the way, is three feet. We should be doing everything we can to allow these kids the freedom to learn. So change the six feet to three feet and allow them to breathe unrestricted air from their three feet separated desks. It's the least you could do. Go back to your health officials and make them prove to you that masks provide any significant safety before forcing them on our children. It's a lot to ask of our child to have their oxygen restricted all day long. I wonder, do you guys try to wear a mask all day like many students have to and then expect them to concentrate and learn and perform in a classroom or on an athletic court or in a on a theatrical stage? I fear that you will not listen to any of these things that we're saying until this gets to a lawsuit. The original reopening guidelines sent out on July 29th are more than sufficient layered measures of safety. Please go back and look at them. The current standard of quarantine is unreasonable. A student can get tested in a day or two, and if negative and symptom-free, they can return to class. Please think about it. Please reconsider. The CDC does not make law. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Can you state your name and address and I'm a, your family members? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Olivia Tryon, 114 Cool Meadow Drive, Centerville, Maryland, 21617. My name is Olivia Tryon and I'm a 10th grader at Queen Anne's County High School. I have some thoughts and research to share with you regarding the mask mandate. As far as the scientific support for the use of a mask, there was a recent report put out by Dr. Russell Baylock where he analyzed the use of a mask. Basically asking, do masks even work? He states that none of the studies established for a conclusive relationship between mask and respirator use and the protection against infection. Further, he talks about how non-infected individuals should not be forced to wear a mask. They're for the sick. For instance, in the past, when a person is diagnosed with tuberculosis, do they say everyone must wear a mask? No, only the infected, not everyone around them. The recommendations for everyone to wear a mask by the CDC are not based on studies of the coronavirus and have not been used to treat any other virus, <coughs> pandemic, or epidemic in history. Why all of a sudden are they being encouraged but not mandated for COVID? As a student, trying to wear a mask for a long period of time is nearly impossible. Sitting in class, how do you expect us as students to listen to our teacher, take notes, answer questions, all at the same time as struggling to breathe? It's nearly impossible, and I don't understand how it's an expectation of us all of a sudden. Doctors have stated that there's a right and wrong way to wear a mask. The public, especially the students in our school, myself included, are not educated in the proper way of wearing a mask. The World Health Organization is adamant that if face masks are not worn carefully, correctly, and kept sanitary, they are worse than ineffective. In other words, masks worn imperfectly are dangerous. And 
And on to the numbers. Although the elderly and those that have autoimmune disorders are getting sick from the virus, normal, healthy kids are not struggling with this. There are people that are dying. The numbers do not match up with the mandate. Based on this data, please make masks optional in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Let my parents make a personal health decision for me. Let my parents do their job as deciding what is right for their child. Masks should not be forced on us students. Those that want to wear a mask should be allowed to wear a mask. And we will respect and support those people that believe that that is the right decision for themselves. But those of us that don't want to wear a mask should not be forced to. Please do not make this our new normal. Give us our free choice. We cannot go on like this. Students are coming home with headaches because they can't think straight, because they're not getting the proper oxygen that they need. There are so many studies that wearing a mask for long periods of time are not healthy. The side effects can vary from headaches to increased airway resistance, carbon dioxide accumulation to hypoxia, all the way to serious life-threatening complications. So let us choose. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your family members. Yes. Okay. You state your name for the you can stand or stand up however you feel comfortable. I'll stand. Okay. Um, name and address. I'm Derek Inselman. I live at 820 Monroe Manor Road in Stevensville, Maryland. Okay. Um, hello everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I'm Derek Inselman, a biotechnologist and process engineer. I have a mechanical engineering degree at UMBC and a master's in biotechnology from Johns Hopkins. At Johnson & Johnson, I grow bacteria that create medical devices that are used to repair the membrane surrounding your brain. One of the most important challenges I deal with is uh, keeping that one specific organism growing while eliminating the risk of contamination. So biological contamination is kind of my thing. Something I've learned over the years is to design the right controls for a given risk. For example, if I'm working with a particularly dangerous chemical, I want a fume hood. This will protect me from the hazards I'm working with. It pulls air from the room I'm in and sends it up an exhaust port. The more dangerous the chemical, the more airflow we use. Now, if I'm working with an organism that I could contaminate with my dirty human germs, I need a biological safety cabinet, which circulates and filters the air. So why does this matter? Because if I used a chemical fume hood when I'm working with my organism, I would contaminate it and kill it. And if I used a biological safety cabinet when I'm handling dangerous chemicals, I would most likely poison myself. You need the right equipment to handle the given risk. There is no one cabinet that will do everything. Now, let's take masks for example. We expect them to protect students from other people while we expect it to simultaneously protect other people from our students. That's not how masks work. Now, do I use masks? Yes. For very specific reasons and never just by themselves. My point is, masks aren't the only tool. No one should be wearing a mask for eight to 10 hours a day. In fact, in the industry, if a person touches their mask, they have to leave the room. They have to change the mask. They have to change gloves. They have to sanitize. So what is to be done? Let's look to industrial design engineers for an answer. They employ dilution, destruction, and filtration. So what is dilution? When your dog farts in your minivan, you roll down the window, and that's dilution, okay? It'll improve the environment. Increasing airflow is a powerful tool that is used to reduce risk. Destruction, in labs, we often employ UV lights at nighttime to sanitize equipment. This can also be done in classrooms at nighttime at a relatively inexpensive cost. And filtration, I believe that this is the intent behind the ProMask camp, um, but I would consider putting the filter someplace physically different. Instead of a randomly loose-fitting face mask, 
that has known, you know, we don't know what material it's made out of, what porosity it is. Um, we could consider something like HEPA filters that are used in clean rooms that trap small particles and have real specifications and maintenance schedules. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Could you state your name and address for the record? My name is Carrie Ann Slakum. Address is 413 Bay City Road, Stevensville, Maryland. I'm a mother of six children, two of which are still in the Queen Anne's County School District. On August 16th, two board members came to the meeting with data and scientific facts as to why masks don't work and the long-term ramifications that are caused by wearing masks for an extended period of time. Others on the board, however, voted with pure emotion and hypocrisy. You cannot sit in front of a room of parents and students and touch and pull down your mask 35 times in 20 minutes and rule for mandatory masking. If a grown-up cannot refrain from touching or pulling down their mask to speak, why on earth would you expect a six, seven, and eight-year-old to do so? You cannot run an establishment that employs many teenage children and vote to have mask mandates when you yourself do not mandate masks for your employees. A letter was sent home after the board meeting on August 16th outlining the mask mandate as well as each child will be given mask breaks throughout their six and a half hour day in school. That is not the case as my son has been in school for the last three days now and has not been afforded a mask break in all three days. The only time he removes his mask is for the 30 minute lunch break to eat. You, the board members, were voted to serve in the best interest of our children and those of you who continue to sit up there and refuse to listen to facts and scientific data are not upholding your obligation to your seats. Your job is to make rational and logical decisions based on facts and statistical data, not politics or personal beliefs. There is a multitude of data to prove that masks do not work. Both the CDC and NIH state that the recovery rate of a person infected with COVID from ages zero to 18 is 99.997 percent of a recovery. I will repeat, 99.997 percent recovery and I work in a hospital for the last 12 years. The, the point, point zero three percent, zero zero three percent, I'm sorry, of serious illness is extremely minute compared to the long-term emotional, psychology, psych psychological and physical damage that you are inflicting on every child in this school district. It is not your job to mandate a medical device to be worn on my child or any child for that matter unless you are a board certified physician, which none of you are. Even though it's a recommendation, not a mandate from a physician. There are no mandates in the state of Maryland per, per our governor. The CDC, which is an absolute joke, recommends masks. But yet three of you vote to man for mandates, which is child abuse in the highest degree, as well as against our constitutional rights to choose. I'm gonna leave the board with 10 words. Pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis, keratosis, sepsis, E. coli, diphtheria, Legionnaire's disease, staph, and fungi. Those are all the toxins and the germs that are on every single mask that a child wears. That was actually studied by the University of Florida with six masks. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Lickin. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, can you state your name and address for the record? Yes, 
I'm Kathy Guerra, 306 Webfoot Lane, Stevensville, Maryland. A recent study has shown that masks are only 10% effective when used properly and are uncontaminated. When I entered the building this evening, I was offered a mask. The person who offered it was holding the mask covering between his fingers and then proceeded to drop it on the floor. The box has been left open on the table for anyone to reach inside and introduce their own germs. I declined to receive one of your masks. Can you guarantee that in your schools, children who are offered masks are being offered them by trained medical professionals, that they're worn properly, that you're now receiving the responsibility of my child's illnesses since you've provided them with protection? Two weeks ago, when you had a meeting where public comment was not allowed, the mask vote was based on postulations and fears. The number of what ifs uttered outweighed the facts. Other than Helen and Mark, who had done research and presented it for the edification of the rest of the board, you appeared to have cast your votes based on your personal feelings instead of the science. The science is clear that our children are suffering due to unfounded fears. I'm not anti-mask or anti-vaccine. I am pro-freedom, and I believe that each of us knows what is best for ourselves and most importantly for our children. The data does not paint a portrait of either an emergency or a need for masking our children. Masking risks damaging their mental health and ultimately causing more suicides and other long-term impacts. I have heard some say that children are resilient. Although correct, this does not mean we test that or force them to be. Governor Hogan has said that more than 80% of the eligible population is vaccinated. If the vaccination is effective, then there is truly no need for a mask mandate besides the fact that there is no indoor mask mandate in the state, only that imposed on the children who aren't yet voters. Our teachers are not trained to be mask enforcers. Their classroom time should be spent on the bridging of the gaps that a year and a half of inadequate instructional access has caused. You passed an equity in, ed in education policy effective this year. Where is the equity for children who are being forced to mask? I have seen the financial benefits that you and the state of Maryland will receive if you continue mandating masks in the classrooms. It's starting to look like you're more interested in the dollars than the children. When in history have we put the responsibility for the health of others on the backs of children? Stop experimenting with our children. It's enough. Let parents make their own decisions. You have all taken oaths to guide our school system within the confines of the law, our constitutions, and the will at the will of the people. I call upon you to seriously search your heart for the truth based on data and not emotion, on data and not teachers' union opinions, on data and not politics, in supporting the oath you solemnly swore to uphold. Fear is not a virtue, and you have the opportunity to show that and lead in the face of fear. Let families decide if their children will wear masks or not. Allow masks, but do not mandate them. Only one side is not dictating to the other what to do. In doing so, the side of freedom honors our core principles of free will, choice, and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is your name and address for the sure uh, thing. my name is amy wales and you're um, like you can take while you're social distancing you can take your mask off if you feel more comfortable speaking. are you sure thank yes. you um my name is amy wales mm -hmm. i live at 720 shy lane in stevensville that's fine. That's fine. Right. thank you sit down or stand up you feel <laughs> thank most you thank you members of the board for having me here today I appreciate what you do to support our schools, our children, and our staff during what I imagine is a very challenging time. My daughter started kindergarten today. It is her first time in a Queen Anne's County Public School, and she had a great day. But it's not my personal needs or beliefs that brought me here today. As I listened to the last board meeting, it was evident that universal masking wasn't a clear issue for all of you. I'm a human resources manager. Like some of you, my job for the last 18 months has been guiding my organization on things like ensuring employee safety, customer safety, and the continuity of business planning. The accountability for that is huge. The liability for my organization if I get it wrong is even greater. As policymakers for a large organization, you have this same accountability and responsibility. And as responsible board members, I'm sure you know that the cost of a lawsuit isn't in the claim itself. It's often not even in the outcome. It's in the defense. 
It's the lawyer's fees, the documentation, the hours and depositions in courtrooms, the bad press, and the time your marketing team will spend trying to recover your reputation. It's why when we craft policies for our institutions, we use widely trusted resources and the laws as our basis. Those things are a strong defense and often head off a claim before it starts. If QAC policies were called into question in the face of child illness or a teacher death or an equitable loss of learning due to extensive quarantines, how would you explain that you had data, but it wasn't supported by the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Department of Health, and OSHA? I wondered if perhaps your hesitancy is that you're questioning your authority to mandate the behavior of children in our schools. Authority and responsibility go hand in hand. You can't grant authority to parents for behaviors in our schools because you, our board, hold all the responsibility. Parents' personal actions won't be called into question if someone dies or becomes seriously ill as a result of attending our schools. Yours will. Their finances and budget won't be impacted. Yours and that of Queen Anne's County Public Schools will be. You can't regulate individual behavior in grocery stores, private businesses, or at family gatherings. You can't choose if they'll be vaccinated or not, but you can mitigate risk that they pose to our schools, staff, and students when in your buildings, and it is your responsibility to do so. As a parent and also someone who wants to see our schools thrive, I'm here to remind you that what we believe isn't what's on the table here. It's what we can defend. Let's keep QAC out of the papers, out of the courtrooms, and continue to be in alignment with the guidance of the CDC, the Department of Health, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the State Board of Education. It's the defensible choice and the responsible one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. state your name and uh, address for the record. Uh, my name is Danielle Schauber. My address is 1200 Round Top Road, Chestertown, Maryland. Um, I don't have a speech really prepared. I just came to offer moral support to the other parents. Um, but uh, I'll just say what, what I can think of to say. I have two boys that um, are in high school this year. One's in ninth, one's in 10th. Um, they don't speak out and I'm just trying to speak for them that, um, you know, we were happy and we got the first update that masks were optional, which I think they should be. I think those who feel they're necessary should be able to wear them. Um, our family, we've, we've all had COVID, um, you know, it was just like a mild flu for us. Um, and uh, when then when we were on vacation the last couple weeks and I uh, saw that the masks were mandated, which I was so disappointed. I just really wanted to pull my students out right then and put them in a, a Christian academy, which is my plan, but they want to stick it out here. So um, I'm just coming to speak for them, you know, that they've been coming in with headaches. Um, my ninth grader told me today he was doing push-ups with a mask on, which, in my opinion, I told him I would just take that right off. I think that's absurd that you're exercising with a mask on, but apparently that is the, the rule. So um, I, I even right on the mask on the boxes that masks come in, it says does not prevent, and you know it says right on there it doesn't prevent infection from anything. So I just I don't understand what this is based on. Um, I think it's wrong, and I'm just here to speak out on behalf of my children, offer support to others. I've never been to anything like this before. This is actually today I watched the the um, last meeting that you had, and I just wanted to see what it was all about and just lend support to the other parents that um, were speaking out and are more well-spoken than I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything, sir, do you? Yes, I do. Um, I'm her husband, Gary Schauber, and I think that our children are being, that they're afraid to speak up and say not wear a mask because they've been taught their whole life to respect elders and do what they're told. So there, our children don't have a voice here. You're, they're being dictated to on what to do. And 
and usually that comes from the parent to do that and they're not having a choice i, I think our kids are, are scared to death to stand up and I commend the two young ladies that were here earlier, and, and they did a fabulous job sitting here speaking in front of you guys. And I feel wholeheartedly that this group and this panel who's been elected and paid officials are, are bullying our children and us as adults. And I think that needs to stop tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Touch the mic too. Over here. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Just state your name and address for the record. And I'm your husband and wife, I'm assuming. Uh-huh. Um, Brianna and Andrew Tibbet, 207 Providence Court, Centerville, Maryland. Good? Yeah, fine. Yeah, good. Okay. So we obviously prepared something to come here. However, it would just be echoing what every other parent has said. So then we prepared something in line. So we've heard all, all the statistics, the CDC, the ill effects of the mask on our children's well-being. So I ask you to think about why this is happening, why people are standing out in that hallway that has no air conditioning, a miserable experience, just to have a chance to have three minutes with you guys because we care about our kids. And I know every other, any other person that disagrees with the way that we feel about not masking our kids use the same excuse, we don't care about our kids, we don't care about the vulnerable. However, they're nullifying their own argument within seconds. The efficacy of the mask, it doesn't exist. If it did, you guys wouldn't be able to sit here and tell us it's about the kids because then it wouldn't matter if I should have the choice to send my kids into the school with no mask. It is my right as a parent to choose what is best for my children. My children do not like wearing the mask. I personally don't like anything about the mask for everything that it stands for. It's just for a way for everyone to politically express their power on adults and children regardless where they are. And the children should not have to deal with it. I wanna give you an example. I had an IEP meeting for my child today. Will not say his name or what school. And they handed me a parental rights handbook scoffed at it to be quite honest with you because I have the right to take my child out of a IEP program that benefits him but I don't have the right to choose if he wears a cloth face mask that does absolutely nothing our children not all of our children have the blue mask they're sold out all the time Germex is back to being sold out cloth facial coverings do absolutely nothing First, everyone uses the excuse, oh, well, it doesn't protect you, it protects other people. Have you guys actually looked at a mask? It is the same material on the inside and the outside. So that is a bogus excuse. I just want us to have the right to make the decision that we feel is best for our children. This is the first time in history that the right for a parent to choose for their kid has been taken away from them. And I would like you guys to consider everything that you've heard tonight, because clearly the entire community that votes you guys in feels the same way. And that's, do you think I covered it? That's all? I do. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. That is all we have. Is that all we have up? signed up? That's all we have all signed up. up. Okay. If anybody, Carla, if anybody signs up, we do. Okay, that's it. We will have one at the end if somebody come in late. If somebody comes in, we'll go ahead and let them sign up okay. and we'll let you know. Okay. Moving on, uh, 701, we have a amendment. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda and move uh, item 7.01 to our next meeting. Um, there was a scheduled conflict. And that's with Sheriff Hoffman. Yes, sir. Regarding school safety. Yeah, thanks. Second. Second. A motion second. Any further discussion? All those here say aye. 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 
Okay, our next thing will be our COVID-19 metrics update. You could um, bring up the slide down on the yep. or Atlanta, either one, please. Thank you. Is that it? It's on the bottom. So, uh, board members, you asked, um, I, I believe it may have even been you um, that asked that you get not only a daily update, but at each board meeting to just look at the right. numbers since the last time we were together. So, this is just a, a slide that actually captures those numbers for you to see um, the case rate per 100,000. Well, I think every board member's gotten their updates on a daily basis. Have everybody got them? Right. So, this is just, and I this think this is this, just this, exactly same well, exact data. But we like the so summary to the public and also until. Until we find out when it's suitable to take mask off or whenever that comes that you know we get updates and the public knows what's Absolutely. going on and where we are correct so you can see the case rate per 100,000 this is a 10-day history um, from 823 through um, 91 and you'll see we pretty much um, stayed kind of within the same range we, we haven't blossomed um, more but we haven't necessarily gotten better so we're pretty much stable right now and in, in where we are and you can see that that it falls into substantial. Um, we really need to target for moderate. That's where we were this summer for summer school, and we did well, and we were able to bring students in with no masks or mask choice, I should say, um, and we ran a successful summer school program when we were um, in the moderate. Um, right now, we're in that substantial, and we've remained in that substantial, you can see, for the last 10 days. Um, next time we come together, we will have this updated for you so you can continue to see that range. Any board members have any questions or what's what we're doing or going on? I just want a, an update of what you think is going to happen with the Board of Education and the state board's sure, decision. Sure, absolutely. So just to, so that people that may not know, Correct. Um, the state board did meet um, and voted to um, go in and have an emergency regulation. Um, and what that basically means, uh, when they put out a regulation, it usually has to go out for public comment. Um, they, it's an extended period of time, public comment comes back, they relook at it and then post it again before they pass it. This um, eliminated that opportunity for a public comment. So it was done in one fell swoop, as in one meeting, they came together, they decided to do a mask mandate for all public school, um, school facilities. And again, that's an emergency regulation that goes to the legislation um, that has to has a period of time and it has to be open as well. We anticipate that we will know on September 14th um, whether that was accepted. Um, of course, the legislation will vote on that. What bothers me on that is, isn't that a, for 180 days? It's 180 days. If that goes through, does that then take our power away to and, demask? And, and we don't know the exact, we don't know that because we don't know all the provisions that they're going to have in there, of whether it's in facility in every building or just in a school facility where, tr where children are. I mean, there's a lot of dynamics there that we, we just don't know yet. And we have no control over. And we have no control over. No, but but I, I you know, I'm concerned too if the state just makes a blanket thing and I look up here. Yeah. We're in, not, we're in, we're, in a, we're high than we need right. to be. We're higher than we but, want to be right I, I now. Look at some counties are in the 40s. Correct. You know, and they, I think if we can get our numbers down to where we feel comfortable. Right, and that moderate. To sit there and have to be thrown into the mm -hmm. whole system, that bothers me some too. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we're responsible for Queen Anne's County. I agree. And we'll continue to update the board. And um, I, you know, and as, a, as you know, We'll have to find out as things go on. It's in, you know it's a progress, but you know I haven't met one person, including myself, which even commented this evening. I'm not a very good poster boy for wearing a mask. Uh, I don't like to wear a mask, but I find it's necessary, and I think it's in the best interest right now for our students. But you know I, I hope you know we can get past this. You know, but. Um, it, it, it's a lot of things. It, it's just not one bullet. It's just not one thing, you know, going on. It's a lot. It's a complicated issue, and I know this board's divided. And I appreciate everybody's view on that. But it's 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 a t it's a tough issue. It's not it's easy. Tough issue. You know. Yes, sir. I know I read MSD's um, statement. Do you know why they made it an emergency regulation as opposed to going through the regular channels so that there was public comment before? Timeline. They felt that there was a necessity because all schools were coming back in session, so they wanted to do it as in a timely um, fashion as they could. So it was it was pure timeline, and that's why it's stated as an emergency. They feel that, that, that you have to get it done quickly because they feel there's a sense of urgency since all the students were coming back to school. Um, between last week and this week, basically all the school districts are up and running.
I have a problem with the state telling us that we can't in two weeks, if the, our numbers go down, why we can't get rid of masks. I mean, I, 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 I just dislike having the idea that they're going to tell us for 180 days we have to have a mask on. If we no, don't I know to. the order will be in place for 180 days, but we don't know what the, the actual order specifics might end up to be. So they might end up putting a set of metrics in there that would mirror some of the things that we're talking about as it relates to our data. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but as we do get updates, I will be sure to forward them through. Would you be willing to, to do board. that as well? If our numbers, or if our metrics go down to a certain number, we get rid of the mask? As it stands right now, absolutely. Um, but if we, we have an emergency, be, if we have an um, emergency mandate, then I, I don't have the authority to do that. So the state board would trump anything that we do. Yes, the state board trumps. Hey, yes. hey, let them, let, let's let them do what they're going to do, and then <clears throat> see what the numbers are going to do for us, and and then we'll make a decision. Yeah. We got a top-notch, a number one lawyer here for yeah. guidance, and. Uh, Thank you, Thank you. Have a good day. We have no control over have a good right week. Now, what the state can do. I think this board's total interest, all five of us, but in the superintendent, is in the best interest of the students. And I think we'd all rather not wear a mask. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I think we can all vote to sit there and say we, we feel we'd rather not. But right now, uh, the majority sees that we should. Um, hopefully, we can change it as soon as possible. You know, we got Labor Day coming up. Hopefully, things will calm back down, uh, and people, you know, we get get our numbers where we where we. Where, uh, Michelle probably is probably more up to date than anybody. You know where we can be. We fought this last two years ago when we shut down. You know, we tried to get under five, wasn't it? It was forever. Mm -hmm. You know, we, as soon as you get close to it, bam, you go back up. Mm -hmm. With the positivity rates that we're just looking at, are we not looking at any, are we looking at children hospitalization or deaths as well? I have not seen that in my data. Or are we just going by positivity rates? Well, we do look at the positivity rate as it relates to um, those students who are 17 and under. Right. And I just shared so, that information last time, and mm -hmm. that's important. And, and actually, our um, student positivity rate um, has increased, and it's over 30% right now. That means over 30% of the cases here in Queen Anne's County are school-aged children. I understand the positivity rate I'm just saying are we where are we like in hospitalization and we deaths? Always look at hospi any, yeah we, we have not had any deaths of students now and we haven't had any um, we have had deaths within the community but not of student age right, okay correct that is correct hmm. let, let me also maybe clear to myself and hopefully I'm say this right and you certainly tell me if I'm off base we have a classroom, and our classes are 20 to 25 students in a class. Most of them. Most of them, but yeah. let's say I'll use 20. Yeah, sure. uh, A student comes into that class, and we weren't masked, and we'd, we'd had, you know, we weren't. And test positive, then wouldn't we have to quarantine? We would contract, quarantine, we have to quarantine seven. the whole school. Yes, so that them. would that affect 20 students to shut down that for a period of time? It, yes. I mean, if, the, if anybody who was in six feet from them would have to, would have to be out for 14 and days. And if you're in a classroom moving around. I mean, there's a lot of different variables. If they're vaccinated, then they can take a test on, you know what I mean? But most of our children aren't. I mean, most I mean, 12 and under aren't. And that, right. so, you know, there's things that we're having to make decisions on, too, just so we can hopefully protect most of the people. Right, we don't go. want an interruption in their learning. And so we have a healthy child here who, um, you know, happens to be exposed because someone chose not to wear a mask, then their, their um, learning is then interrupted. So you're taking their learning away from them and they didn't have that choice. They couldn't make that choice themselves because they can't mandate that another student wear a mask. Um, so that, that's really, it's, it's to eliminate that disruption within um, the student's learning. So, uh, I mean, essentially, um, I could be ex exposed over and over again. So I could come to school, be in school for two days, and then somebody next to me chooses not to wear a mask. So then I have to be quarantined for 14 days because I'm too young to be vaccinated. And then after that 14 days, I could literally come back for one day and be exposed and be out for another 14 days. And we could do, just, that cycle could continue on and on. Um, so in masking students at this time, um, we, we don't have to do that. I did have a concern with just a couple of the parents. If, I mean, if this is something to think about is, were they really doing push-ups and required to wear a mask while they're doing push-ups? Because no, that's I, a lot of exertion. Right. And, so that and was I don't know the answer to that, but I certainly took that and I looked up. Okay. Grabbed. And I did have a few mm -hmm. people email and said that their kids were not getting mask breaks. I know that our rule, and I, and I should have made a motion to make it mandatory because when it says suggested mask breaks, this happened last year that they didn't happen. Um, 
I mean, I personally have been to every building. I saw kids out that were taking mass breaks. Yeah. And so uh, we do have a principal call to do a, like a debrief from the first week to say, and that'll be one of the priorities to say, please make sure you're ensuring that all um, students are afforded the opportunity to have a mass break. And so it's, it's something that just needs to be monitored. But I absolutely know that, um, that when I was going through the schools, I absolutely saw the kids out having mass break. So, um, you know, we just need to monitor it. Right. We're not perfect. We aren't. And we just need to get in a really good pattern. And, and, I, and I will do my very best to communicate with principals um, to have that. And when they're monitor. playing sports, when they're actively engaged they in the sport, to, they don't wear masks, right? No. And, and is um, that indoor as well? Like well, volleyball? we changed it to indoor because um, the volleyball kids were, they were successfully being six feet apart and not, I mean, they took Got it very it. seriously. Sure. Our kids have been amazing. They took it very seriously. They proved that they could do it. So we said, hey, you're doing a great job. Sure. And so we allowed that to um, change. Dr. Ciotola, I talked with him and said, hey, I, I have proof that they are doing what they need to do. And so um, we decided that that was the best case scenario. Um, but outside, no, they don't have to mask if they're on the field engaged in their activity. Dr. Sands, I brought this up last time. If they have a socially distanced room, and they could take their masks off. If they are three to six feet away from each other, they should. If they're be... six feet, if they're six feet, they can remove it. Not three to three to six. Um, three to six feet is basically so that we can in class. If we're both masked and we're three feet apart from each other, which these markers are three feet. So if I'm three feet apart, then and and we're both wearing a mask, then I don't have to quarantine. That's where the three to six feet comes in play. But to de-mask, you have to be six feet, and that's why we have here six feet between. Um, Mr. Schifanelli and Mr. Smith. So that's why Mr. Schifanelli doesn't have to have his mask on right now. So the only possible, possible classrooms could be like a, a first grade or a second grade if there's not more than 20 students. I'm just thinking about how the Well, we do have some unique situations. School, how Maybe the classrooms are like set up. an AP chemistry class might only have eight students in it and has a very large okay. room that has lab work and student area for desk work. So those students would be able to, you know, that would be a perfect example. Okay. Um, otherwise, it's, it is very difficult for us to have a classroom um, that's large enough to accommodate that six-foot distancing. Mm -hmm. Hey, last question, I, at least for me. Um, we do have a policy or a protocol, right, for normal old-fashioned flu, right? In other words, if there's a certain percentage of the school that gets flu, what is that? It's, it's, and it's not just the flu. It's really anything. It could be head lice. It could be strep throat. It could be okay. flu. So anything that kind of is targeted to a school, we start to see that in the 10% range of students being out 10%. for that, um, then we start to look at the situation and say, hey, we need to shut the school down for a period of time. It depends on what it is. As I said, head lice is treated a little differently than strep throat. Or yeah, than I the found out when uh, yeah. I had young kids. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we usually use a, about a 10% threshold um, to be able to make that decision. 10%. Yeah. Okay. More or less. Yeah. And, th and, that, and that goes for too, if, uh, you know, now even with COVID, staffing wise, we start to get to that 10% threshold of staff being out, we start to worry about how do we cover classes? How do we adequately sure. supervise and deliver instruction? And so we might have to close an individual school down for a period of time to get people well and then get that one school back up and running. And I just had one more question. I, and, and I hate that we're kind of ending this because it's been such positive stuff, the whole meeting about opening and the, yeah. and the meetings. Yeah. But um, I did have concern about the young lady who said that her daughter has a medical exemption and seems to have been kind of... I can understand because I know that when I came in today and you guys had me on the floor because I am choosing this option that, you know, and I'm an adult and it kind of made me feel like... Uh, an outcast. So right. is that really, is that our policy? Is that we stick them away? We have away to until, create an accommodation okay. plan. And that accommodation plan is that they can't move. I mean, we can't have them in a hallway with 50 other people. So um, yeah, they have to, to, to move. Like it said, and I use the example, if I broke my leg, I'm not going to be in a hallway jam full of people trying to get from class to class. And for those students, we do accommodate them by they wait, wait behind, classes change, and then they move um, to the next class. Class, so it's similar to that. Okay. And she does have to eat alone, or he or she, or at, they have to eat alone? At, at the ta at, in the oh. lunchroom, okay. there's usually at the two to three people at each table. So um, as long as they're six foot, I don't know in that particular case. I don't know how large that table is. There are different sizes across the district. Um, I was at the annex the other day. Most of those were two, um, you know, across from each other. So, um, so when they're eating, 
I was thinking that when they're sitting down eating, there's everyone has to maintain six foot distance when they're. It's impossible. We really can't do that. So then, it's, why it's would really she be eating alone if she's like three feet? You know what I'm saying? Like, right. What? Yeah. So as I said at that table, it's, we're trying our best to do six okay. feet uh, where we can. We absolutely are, um, and that's why we put tents up and things like that. That would be something I'd have to look into. Okay. But um, as I said, we have to create an accommodation plan. We can't just allow that person to come in and sit here because they're jeopardizing everybody else. If they come in and somebody is exposed, they're jeopardizing. That's Dr. Why, Sands, I'm sure you're yeah. going to check in on it tomorrow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. I had a few questions. Um, after reading a lot of emails going both ways, supporting the mask, not supporting the mask. No, I'm sorry. You can't hear me. Um, so there was concern about some complaints of the children wearing the mask at recess and the teachers telling them to put it back on. So I had concerns about that, mm -hmm. um, if that's happening to have that addressed. Because if they're outside, there really is no reason to have the mask on. Um, and then, again, the spacing in the classroom, if, if they can be spaced to get that mask off of them. Um, and then I had a question about testing. I know mm -hmm. some school systems are offering rapid tests. Um, I can tell you at work, I've had some calls. It's hard to find testing so they can get back in school if they're presumed or been exposed. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as funding for um, rapid testing, Right, so we, we, are, stand there? we are partnering up to offer that within the schools. Um, we have um, Matt Evans can kind of get, and Maria can actually um, give you more detail of that, but we are um, partnering with a company. Mm -hmm. We actually interviewed, I think, five and um, to see which one would be the best fit for our district and give us what we needed as a, as a community. And um, so I can, we did select, we finally did select one this past week. I can certainly share all that information with the board and how it works and what it looks like. Okay, I um, appreciate that. Yeah, sure. And I mean, just like you said, the, the quicker we can get the test and get the test results back, then the less disruption to their education as possible. So um, that's why we chose to do that and take that opportunity. That's great. And I assume that would be ESSER funds for rapid testing. Do we have ESSER funds? I, uh, but it's not under, it's under a specific grant. I'm sorry. Thank okay. you yeah. for, yeah. I talked to Matt Evans this week and it would actually be free, but it's a different funding source. Out okay. Well, yeah. that's I was like, I know it was an ESSER funds, but I was like, my mind, too many buckets out there sometimes. Thank you for rescuing me, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have plenty of questions about that, but I'll save it for your presentation. Yeah, I definitely will send something out to the board um, to make sure that, that you guys know um, who we selected and what the criteria was of why we selected them. And the process they'll do? Yes, and the process they will, yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, and this, and this break, and you know, we have 7,500 students in our system. I'm sure there might be one that had to do a push up with a mask on that shouldn't be doing it. I mean, that's, that's you know, I think we need to work with everybody. But I think our staff, our teachers, our principals are trying to work with people to give them breaks. You can, you know, you meet with everybody all the time, iterate, yeah. just do the best we can while we have to be masked. Um, the other thing is, you know, us board members, we don't, we don't sit up here and want to mandate decisions that we have to make to people. That's not what we want to do. What we have to do is what we think in best interest as a whole for Queen Anne's County School System. I'll speak for myself and I think the rest of the board. We, we don't want to make these decisions, but we have to make these decisions for the best interest. And that's why we're here. And I know some people agree with us, some people don't. Even the board split on it. So, but we respect everybody's opinion and hopefully things can get back to even more normal. But let me tell you, after, and I'll say it again, every school I, I was glad to see us in school five days a week. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. Any other questions on COVID-19 metrics update or anything? Okay, as a fun update. Watch out buckets, I'm gonna bring buckets. <laughs> Thank you, they wall. save me every time. <laughs> Because we'll reference these here. <laughs> I moved them today. I man. love Don't visual worry. aids. Yes. <laughs> okay.
Good evening, Dr. Salins, President Smith, board members. Tonight, I bring before you a presentation on Esther. Before I do, I'd like to talk about some of our funding that we have in FY22. We have additional funding that we're seeing that I'd like to explain, so that's why there are different buckets in front of us tonight. Normally we have the state aid funding, which is your um, compensatory education, your special ed, your transportation, and your foundation. Well, what we're seeing this year is that transition from Kerwin. Is it okay if I take this off? Yeah, yeah, while you're speaking, feel Okay, right. thank you. You're away from everybody. Getting out of breath. <laughs> Um, so we're seeing the transition from Kerwin to the Blueprint Funds. So if we look at FY22, the Blueprint Funds, what we're seeing and what we were awarded from the state under supplemental pre-K is $133,539. That's unrestricted and used for our pre-K programs. In addition, in that um, blueprint bucket, we had the teacher incentive grant. This was awarded back in FY20, and it was 544,458. And as you know, once you have that raised, it goes forward each year. So we're seeing just that amount each year forward, no addition to that. The next one under the blueprint is your students with disabilities grant. That is restricted as well for 392,812, and that holds some special ed positions. Under our blueprint funds too, we're seeing TSI, what they call transitional supplemental instruction, that's tutoring, and that is restricted to kindergarten through third grade, and this is through House Bill 1372. Of course. Oh, it's just a basic overview. I thought it would be helpful if I can I can send it to you in a that'd link. Be that'd be fine. Thank okay. Like okay. Down and I'm, I'm not seeing anywhere. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was a lot, isn't there? It's a list, so I, I'll definitely send that as well. Um, so we're seeing TSI in our blueprint too as well at 133,820, like I said. And then the last thing in the blueprint funds this year for 22 for Queen Anne's County is our mental health coordinator. It is restricted and it's for 83,333 and that supports one mental health position. So in addition to our state aid funds, those are what they call the blueprint, which is the transition from Kirtwin. The next, the next bucket that we have in front of us here is the ESSER funding. And the ESSER funding has been fluid, which means that it changes based upon our needs. So we're gonna go in tonight to look at where we've been in and what we're um, proposing for the future for the ESSER two and ESSER three funding. So for the ESSER funding, for ESSER two, the award for Queen Anne's County was a little over three million. And for ESSER three, it's 6.8 million. And they call it ARP, so it's Amer under American Rescue Plan. And in addition to the ESSER funding, we also have an ARP grant for a reopening, and that is for 404,814. And we'll go more into that in the presentation. And finally, the last bucket here, we have the supplemental. The supplemental funding is both through the state and the um, federal government. So under House Bill 1372, it provides a small amount for Queen Anne's County for summer school funding for FY22. We have reserved it for our summer LMS program for next year, and the amount of, of the award to Queen Anne's County was 93,803. Under supplemental funding, Queen Anne's also received trauma and behavioral health, health under House Bill 1372. And that was for 104,162. Mr. Evans identified the need and what he has um, allocated for tentatively is for a school climate team with multi-tiered system of supports and restore, restorative approaches, social and, emer and emotional learning and supplies and curriculum for that need. Now under supplemental, there is another tutoring grant under House Bill 1372 for $730,006. This identifies those students that are grades four through grades 12. So in the blueprint fund, we they identified kindergarten through third grade under the supplemental. They've allocated funds for grade four through 12 for tutoring. 
And then last but not least, there's a small portion under House Bill 1300 for 116,000 for an additional TSI instruction for tutoring. So it's a basic overview, but I'll make sure that you get it in detail. Uh, Tyrus, do you mind me asking? I tried to find House Bill 1372 and read where all of this money was coming from, and I wasn't getting it. Is there something that you have that maybe breaks it down that you wouldn't mind forwarding as well? Absolutely. Thank you so much. appreciate that. This year was unprecedented too with all the changes in the legislation that we were seeing. It was um, in, in the, until the 11th hour in the middle of June till they got finalized with our numbers that um, and then there's additional more money that came out available through the art plan and things like that. So I just wanted to give an overview but definitely we'll reach out with the details. We've done an amazing job. You stay on top of it when Dr. Salen's <laughs> We are trying. Right I am much more polite trying. about it than that. <laughs> <laughs> I did <laughs> well, no, I didn't. Really. I mean, but you just have. I just meant yeah. like you just have. Like it's She's magic. magic. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's what how you I meant. meant it. <laughs> So it, it is encouraging the amount of tutoring funds that's available that we're seeing that are coming through. I know uh, Ms. Hudock has a meeting with the principals tomorrow to really dive into the allocation. The allocation for the tutoring funds, it's really um, regulated. It's not by the number of students in the building, it's based upon the need. And the principal identified the needs with Ms. Hudock on, on the number. And that's how it was allocated towards the schools. So we're going to dive into ESSER here. Everything ESSER. Everything ESSER. Everything you plus wanted more, to know. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> plus yes. more, plus more. So if we look at past history for ESSER here, for Queen Anne's County in 2020, ESSER 1, we received 739,946. In gears, 51,634. ESSER broadband was 708,000, but it was extremely restrictive for us. Under ESSER tutoring, 395, 586. And then ESSER technology at 500, I mean, 858,432. So in FY20, we saw a total of a little over 2.7 million in ESSER funding. That's a question. Mm -hmm. That broadband, did we use all of that? Oh, I was getting ready to get to that slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, of course. So um, we'll start with the first one, ESSER 1, 739,946. A majority of it went through to PD stipends at 54,000, contracted services at 147,300, and that was for a learning management system of Momentum and Zoom. And then the rest of it, majority of it went to supplies at 56.5%, which was for your operations supplies, bus supplies, and so forth. So that made up ESSER 1, all of ESSER 1 funds have been expended. We go into gears one. The award was 51,634. The total amount was spent for uh, communications, which what it was geared towards, and that was for the data plans. So we saw 50,045 in data plans. Under the broadband here at 708,000, this was very restrictive grant. It was only reserved for underserved students from September 1 of 20 through December of 20. It did extend through March 31st, 21. And Mr. Combs did a great job of trying to identify all the students that would um, benefit from the MiFi services from that. This actually was um, on the shore. A lot of the other school systems struggle to spend out this grant. So what they've done is they've actually contacted the person in charge of this grant and to see if they could um, reuse this or reissue this grant, but less restrictive. So we're waiting to hear back on that is my understanding from Mr. Combs on that. The next one that we saw on 20 here is your ESSER tutoring at 395,586. Majority of it, over half, went to stipends at 226,126. And then another portion was contracted services to Schoolology at 86,075. The 
last one here that we saw in 20 was your ESSER technology at 858,432. A majority of that was for your ESSER, I mean, for your Chromebook speakers and technology needs at 788,644. So almost 92% of that um, ESSER technology and all that has been spent out as well. The Chromebooks was for grades one. It, I, I, it was one and two, I believe. It was at least two grades, if not three. Two kindergartens, just one and two. Correct. So now we're into fiscal year 21. What we saw in fiscal year 21 was the emergence of ESSER 2 at a little over $3 million, GEARS 2 at $1 million, which was a competitive grant that was awarded to Queen Anne's, only one of 10 in the state. Oh. And the last one was ESSER reopening at 404814 So in FY21, we saw funds come through ESSER at $4.3 million. Diving into the detail under ESSER 2, as of June 30th, 219,000 was spent out of this grant so far. It was dedicated um, mostly for summer enrichment and material as far as math books for instruction. Gears 2, that competitive grant, just a basic overview, I'm not gonna do it justice, so I apologize, but the priority under this was um, to explore and summer camp engagement. Another priority was STEM Middle School Unified Arts, and then construction of outdoor classrooms. And then the last one under FY21 was the ESSER reopening grant. Total spent as of June 30th was 117,869, of which communications was 74,505. Remember that broadband ended in March, so this was taken up from March to June, and then custodial and cleaning supplies. So now we get into ESSER 3 in 2022, and this is what people are calling the ARP, American Rescue. Queen Anne's County was awarded $6.8 million. Unfortunately, um, this was based upon Title I funding, and Title I funding for Queen Anne's County put us second to the bottom in the state as far as receiving these funds. So what I've, what I've placed in front of you is a proposed amendment to ESSER 2. Uh, a little background too before we get into the actual amendment and budget narrative for ESSER 3. Over the summer, we surveyed, um, Ms. Hudock surveyed over four, and we've received over 1,400 responses from um, people on how they would like to see the ESSER funds being used. And so what you're seeing tonight here in the budget narrative and amendment is from that survey, we reached out and had several different meetings with our Blueprint Implementation Committee, uh, feedback from that group, as well as from ANS, for, from the building uh, supervisors, uh, principals, and so forth. So um, tonight we bring before you the, the budget amendment for number two and also ESSER 3. ESSER 3, really um, the federal government is asking us to tie it to learning loss. At least 20% has to go to learning loss. And if we look at ESSER 3, ESSER 3 application was due the middle of August. And and we were submitted it timely. This is just to, to have it, um, this is from the feedback from everyone. It was turned in timely. We're awaiting response from them, which I'm thinking mid-September to the end of September on that. But this is also fluid. As we know, it, um, COVID situations change. So we can bring amendments forth to what the needs are currently in the system. So if we look at the first one, budget amendment number two for ESSER funds, you can see that website design is on there, a flyer connect, cafeteria tables, picnic tables, COVID supplies, projectors, 
smart boards, whiteboards, computer equipment, desks, gym equipment, vehicle, and miscellaneous. So the above requests are for a little over $2 million. The funds spent to date, which is a majority of it, was for that summer school program at 930, which balances us out to a little over $3 million. So you will give us, you will give us who we are purchasing all of these from? Uh, the vendors? Yes. Oh, of course. Okay. And since some of these things are over 25000 we just vote on it collectively? Is that what we're doing? Well, um, what we'll do is we'll bring each vendor to you. Anything over twenty five in total for the year will, um, is required to come in front of the board. What um, I just, uh, the update, if you remember from that website redesign, uh, Lynette brought, or Miss mm -hmm. Passwaters brought it last month, and we actually, actually took that out to bid to get competitive okay. pricing. We received five bids, and and as you know, it's not only best price, it's also best value. And who we awarded to actually ended up being um, scored as both. That's awesome. But you're, right now, you're looking at just moving this category to say what we're going to use it for right now. Yes. Not purchasing anything. Not purchasing. Uh, well, it... If it's over, like let's say the cafeteria tables, I know someone from Mr. Pender's department and mine are supposed to meet this week and look at cafeteria tables, uh, getting the order together, we'll have it by the vendor and they'll have to come in front of the board for approval right. because in total it does over exceed that 25,000. Is time- any, any, Anything over 25, like Tammy said, mm -hmm. would be coming from this board as a proposal with, with bids and done the proper the way we do it. Absolutely. Mr. Smith, what I would like to ask is, is our time of, of the essence, do we need these tables quickly? Right. and, and and the goal is to, is to get it for you for the next meeting. Okay. Yes. We'll be able to get them in tables. time. Uh, we can get quotes and estimates is my hope. It's going to yeah. be a while. The manufacturer, it just depend on if they have them in stock or not in stock. But I mean, as far as getting the quotes and all, yes, that's not a problem. Okay. What's the transit vehicle used for? Uh, Mr. Pena, did you want to speak more to that, your transit vehicle? Uh, food distribution. Mm -hmm. right, but what are we using now? Do we have one? Are we replacing we it? We have one that uh, mm -hmm. Fred Flintstone would probably be proud of. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's got age and miles on it. And um, we, we had a tough time just keeping it running, trying to get the food back and forth this year. But, I mean, uh, Julie did a great job with it, but it's, it's time to replace it. Then uh, we can look at the SR3 narrative that was submitted in. Can I so, go back real quick? Of the, the student desks. Mm -hmm. I understand that we are low on student desks. Will you be bringing that to us at the work session? Because mm -hmm. time is definitely the essence on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So you can see SR2 for the budget amendment really focused on the, the needs in the schools as far as social distancing with the cafeteria tables. Um, the picnic tables, the COVID supplies, and things like that. When we dive into ESSER 3, ESSER 3 is for that learning loss. And proud to say, based upon the feedback, we got a lot of great feedback in the different meetings that we were in. And highlighted in blue, you can see everything that is really tied directly to learning loss. And for Queen Anne's County, it's close to 80% of this grant of $6.8 million is going towards um, learning loss. So if we go up top here, we look at two interpreters district-wide, a technology coordinator, and this was identified through the Blueprint Group as far as if you're having technology issues, who do you call? Who you, Now you, there's a help desk that we're hoping to implement here. Um, the next one is permanent substitutes. I'm not sure if you want to expand on that or not, Dr. Salins. Yeah, so um, obviously we have a shortage of substitutes and um, this permanent substitute concept is that each permanent substitute would be um, like a part of their faculty. So they would actually be, um, you know, at a certain school every day um, and they would be a full-time um, staff member there. So um, looking a little bit different than a substitute who would typically go in and kind of choose, you know, I want to be at this school or the next day they might be at a different school. This would be a person who would be 100% assigned, assigned to one school. And so we actually were able to put 20 of them in the ESSER funds, um, one for most schools, two for our largest, which are our two high schools. And then that left us 
consensus with four to look at um, how can we design it and, and we're in the very early stages of this so you know things evolve but how do we use them to help our students who may have to quarantine um, so if they use Schoology as a platform for teachers to be able to put information and schoolwork on there and the student may have some needs but the teachers in the classroom teaching how can a substitute be able to either engage with them online or answer questions and help them to move through what they need to do um, to try to stay as engaged as possible while they're in a quarantine state again we don't have every single detail ironed out yet we might try something and have to tweak it because we have never done it before it's new for us but we're gonna um, do the best we can to to make that as available for students if they're quarantined that the other ones would be designated per school and then I see down here below the uh, the taxes for those those um, <coughs> positions and health care possibly yes so that's all budgeted in here yes okay yes the, these two these uh I'm sorry these substitutes would be on a yearly contract that, that yes they would be full-time for contracted for a year but they would understand it's only for a year yes and then hopefully there would be year to year we have lots of contracts actually like that for okay. our support staff so that wouldn't be something that we're not. I mean, it's not doing. in the general budget, it, so it's. It, I mean, it these is, are not. This would be ESSER funds, so these would be funds that we're we're allocating it, through ESSER funds for three years. So this so, would be so in we, place for three years for sure. And then I don't know. We would have to look at the sustainability of it using operating budget from that point but, forward. But I understand this budget. So this uh, this stuff is only for three years. Or this is only year. for three years. Um, and then it, we'd have to look at exactly all of this is for three years. We'd have to look at sustainability. Although we don't know what's going to happen, we may get additional funds um, we, we really don't know I mean um, but we know for certain that we've you know budgeted out for three years with all the things that you see here the next item that we have listed is an accountant and just want to add this um, I know it sounds a little selfish but um, Queen Anne's County we are second on the shore as far as our annual budget and and um, all the other counties on the shore has an accountant and it's just um, we are with the additional ESSER funds we are um, basically working um, nights weekends over holidays to make sure everyone gets pay um, this first pay I'd just like to recognize Karen Colley too because she has really um, done an amazing job in making it seamless with this um, first pay too as well and then, so that's why that is in there just wanted to explain that further uh, the next one is two social workers and then the next five, four or five items there is for next year for the summer enhancement program. I ask what's the social workers? Why? Why? Um, the connection and engagement for students. Um, they, they do actually, they're very similar to um, our, what our PPWs do in many aspects of things. Um, <clears throat> And so that, that counseling, that aspect of the whole child, the wraparound services, so really PPW, social workers, um, all of those are, are necessary, I think, at this time um, to connect and re-engage as many students as possible. Um, you know, we've talked about the social and emotional well-being of our students, and they really play a key role in that. So, and that was a recommendation from the committee, the advisory committee that was together, as well as, and it was actually, I think, when, when Jane pulled her information, it was like 14 responses but to date there was just over 2,000 responses so really this was um, an indication of a need that everybody saw within the district our stakeholders thank you mm -hmm. so then that the next item is contracted services and as you can see there is peer deck learning platform this was requested by the school's uh, principals performance matters for years two and three Agile Minds for two years, Math 180 for two years, your summer transportation, Schoology, a placeholder for the LMS, if that's the route we choose to go going forward, but there's a placeholder for a learning management system, and then uh, STEM projects um, for extensions and highly engagements for your gifted and talented students at $1,600. The next one is supplies and materials, different supplies and materials that were requested throughout the district is listed and then other costs is going to be your fringe associated with your salaries and 
that makes up ESSER uh, 3 budget narrative at 6.8 million. The actual budgeted for learning loss, like I said, was almost 80%, 5.3. And I just want to go back and take the board back to the contracted services. You'll see some of the programs in there that we currently do, Agile Mine, we've done that for many years. Um, and Math 180. And Math 180, those types of things. And I think that it's important, and performance matters for that matter, I think it's important to note here that those we're going to have to work back into the operating budget. Um, we, you know, obviously came into an extremely tight budget year. Um, as I jumped on board, um, we were struggling with trying to make things work. And so we did offload some of those things into ESSER funds, but we're absolutely going to have to work hard to make sure that we finagle our operating budget, that we include those as a line item moving forward once the two year or three years is out. So we're not off the hook for that. Um, it's something that we have to keep on, keep, you know, revisiting and revisiting so that, that we can make sure that we can continue to fund them once these funds are gone. I think that, that plays to the thing that we all know using fund balance. That's something we got exactly, to get control over that because exactly right. with our fund balance being utilized for our current budget and then knowing we have other costs coming in three years down the road, it's going to put somebody in a bad situation. That's exactly right. So we have to definitely try to be as proactive. It's not, it's not it's all, it's all, you know, we're going to have a train wreck in right. three years. So essentially we have the next two to three years to work this, in. to work this into the operating budget. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank Sorry. You. Just reading. Uh, no, I appreciate thank you. you. Thank okay. You so thank much. you. It's always thank so you. helpful. Really. Thank so many numbers. Yes. Yeah, so many numbers. <laughs> I think she dreams numbers at night. <laughs> I don't doubt You're it. You're not going to be a teacher. You're going to stay doing this. Yeah, I know. Yes. Right? She did. She was. So, it was great to see her so excited <laughs> to be a part of it, and we were so happy to have her on our tours. And she's just like, this is the coolest thing ever, right? I mean, I was so I was excited to see her excited. You know, it was great. Can we move forward, Mr. Smith, with yes. our action items? I mean, there's a break on here. Just no, asking. no, I, we'll go through the break. We're not going right, to, unless you. anybody sees one, everybody. I'm okay. <laughs> okay, we have your, we've had our human resource and substitute bus driver report in front of us. Um, anybody got any more, anything on that? It's mostly personnel. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to accept the human resource and sub substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session? Second. Uh, first and second. Uh, can I have all those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Next thing we have our physical uh, year 2021 unrestricted budget amendment approval. You have that in front of you, Jane. <clears throat> I bring before you a transfer request. This transfer request is the final one for fiscal year 21. This actually um, is for an allocation of 65,000 under the administration category to transfer it in from salaries and wages. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve uh, the transfer request of $65,000 from instructional salaries and wages to administration uh, budget source, fiscal year 2021, unrestricted budget. With a motion, I have a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, do we have any other public comment? Is it anybody else? No. We're done. Moving on, our future meetings. Our next uh, meeting will be September the 15th, a work session, followed by uh, October the 6th will be our next regular board meeting. I will not be here, uh, Mr. President, for the, on next, the 6th. for the work session, correct. For the work session, okay. May I ask, Dr. Salins, is that the time that you are gonna be presenting the goals for the district, or do you think you've already? Oh, I'd be happy to do that. For okay. You. I didn't know if that was something that we still needed. Well, we could push that off. If Helen's not going to be here, push it off to the next meeting. Whatever the board, I would be happy to do whatever date you would like. Okay. We can talk you about it. You just want to send it to me and. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Dr. Sams about okay. it. Again. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, Helen, you're not going to be here on the 15th. 15th, correct. Darren. Can she not vote or anything? Can she vote remotely if there was something up or not? Board members not going to be here. Yeah, not if not if your not if your meetings 
format is this format, someone wouldn't join in from. Okay. By virtual or by camera or like that. Okay. So we'll have four board. We do have four. We need three board members. So we have three board members unless something happens. Well, as, as we were told tonight by Ms. Towers, the only thing we, that should be coming up for vote is the allocation of funds to purchase the things that are necessary for right. the schools. And, and, Hel and Helen will get an uh, agenda and all that prior to it. So. Um, she can contact Dr. Salem and she has any right, questions. And I will try to secure um, uh, Sheriff Hoffman. Um, On next yeah, agenda. On the next agenda. And um, I saw him. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Sounds good to me. Uh, motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.